I want to thank the members of the National Leadership Prayer Breakfast for this special opportunity to share in this 42nd anniversary of the breakfast. I consider it a blessed opportunity to share with those present and with those joining in the virtual space. I will humbly seek to share a biblical word with the intention to encourage and to challenge all the leaders here present. Permit me to acknowledge those in the virtual space wishing me well and to acknowledge my wife present praying for me. Ladies and gentlemen, I was born in 1980. Approximately five weeks before the general election in that year. The community in which I grew up, unfortunately, was one of those communities impacted by the violence in the nation at the time. My mother and father, with whom I spoke this morning, told me a story that in that period, while I was in her belly waiting to be born, shots were being fired in the community. And she tells me, I don't know how this happened, but it is as if the fire from the mouth of the gun flashed before her eyes. She jumped off the bed with me in her belly, obviously desiring to protect me from harm that she think may have been pending. And I heard that my father said, this one will either be a gunman or a preacher. Some of you may be aware that I have multiple passions and I'm blessed with involvement in other areas of my life, but I perhaps could not escape the call to be a preacher. It is for that reason that I think it is fitting for me to share this morning as I celebrate the 42nd anniversary of this breakfast in a year in which I'll celebrate the 42nd anniversary of my birth. And this year's theme Pressing forward in faith, hope, and love is a very fitting and appropriate encouragement in the context of our present societal realities. The appeal this morning comes against a backdrop of circumstances that can and have caused many to shrink back in distress, pull back in dis disillusionment, and cower in fear. Pressing forward in faith, hope, and love is therefore a fitting summon for all Jamaicans. To be clear, when we talk about faith, hope, and love, these are not empty platitudes. These are not just religious words and high-flown cliches. These are not esoteric concepts, but very practical requirements for meaningful living for all of us as human beings. If indeed we cannot believe despite uncertainty, expect the best despite negativity, and passionately pursue the well-being of our fellow human beings, then our life's journey and the quality thereof 
will be hampered. To move forward these virtues of which we speak, the three that will remain are not only essential, but I submit are necessary. They are active ingredients in the mission to move forward. But permit me, ladies and gentlemen, to make clear that the how in the theme, faith, hope, and love, cannot be considered sufficiently without dealing with the what in the theme moving forward. I am suggesting that faith, hope, and love, the necessary virtues to move forward, must have a vehicle for moving forward. The essential elements of faith, hope, and love must be enabled in order for us to move forward. These character fruits must have a framework in which to thrive. I therefore suggest two imperatives if pressing forward in faith, hope, and love is going to be reality and not just rhetoric. The two imperatives are we must press forward with right actions based on right motives. And secondly, we must press forward with right attitude based on right mindset. Right actions based on right motives and right attitude based on right mindset. Let's take the two in turn. Pressing forward in faith, hope, and love in this time requires a discipline, brothers and sisters, leaders, to do things right and to do the right things. Our potential as a nation will never be maximized without a recognition that we cannot get right results from wrong actions. Certainly not over the long term. We cannot achieve great outcomes without right inputs. We cannot reach high heights with horrendous habits. Truly, if we're honest, we will confess that while as a nation we have much to be proud of, we have performed our, below our potential because of our failure over many years to do things right and to do the right things. We have underperformed despite the richness of our heritage, despite the skills of our people, despite the bounty of the blessings of the Lord on our land. And I suggest that this underperformance is significantly related to the accumulation of wrong things done and things done wrongly. Our country has bled and continues to bleed from the wounds inflicted by those who are determined to do wrong and perhaps aided and abetted by those who have failed to resolve that determination with equal commitment in the opposite direction. I therefore want to raise up this morning, a portion of a written message captured in 1 Corinthians 13 by a transformed man who became a transformational leader. His name is Paul. He wrote this message to a city called Corinth, a Greek city who at the time was facing their own set of spiritual and social problems. And I see in this portion of the scripture, particularly the portion between verse 1 and 3, an emphasis on right actions based on right motives. Because indeed, what is right action if it's not based on the right motives? I see in the text a strong suggestion that right actions based on right motives are what really matter. We need to do the right things and we need to do the right things for the right reason. 
He says in the text that was read earlier, if I speak in the tongues of men, but do not, and, and angels, but do not have love, then I am a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. He says, if I have the gift of prophecy, and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have faith, I can move mountains. But I do not have love. He says, I am nothing. He says, if I give all that I possess to the poor, but do not have love, that I, you know, I do it to boast, but have no love. He says, I gain nothing. This hard-hitting tough talking spiritual leader in this intriguing text assumes an interesting posture perhaps as a demonstration of the love he spoke about I don't know if you realize but he speaks in the first person and I humbly adopt the protocol by the wise preacher as I seek to apply the lesson from these verses permit me to bring the statements closer to home therefore perhaps we can understand this better if, if I say though I am a church leader spiritually gifted and charismatic but if my aim is not to develop and serve those in my congregation and in the community with love even if my titles are lofty and my resume is long, then I'm a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Perhaps he's saying, if I'm a business leader, and though I'm erudite, if I'm not looking out for my people and seeking to actively enrich the life of all my stakeholders and add meaning to the life in the community, then it profits me nothing. Paul is a saying, though I serve on prestigious and powerful boards, but I am not interested in serving the people and the purposes to which I am called and appointed, but instead only concerned with advancing my own reputation, then I am nothing, he says. Though I serve as member of parliament and pass laws that govern the people, and though I beat the bench and shout here, here, in parliament, if I do not serve with an uncompromising commitment to uplifting my constituents and serving the national good, I beat the benches, but I'm a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Though I serve as counselor, in one of the municipal corporations, if I do not serve with the intention to positively impact the lives of those in my division, then I am a clanging symbol. The oppressive nature of my spiritual giftedness as a church leader, my impressive intellect as a leader in the academy, my business acumen as a captain of industry, my political capital as a leader in politics, my medical training and sharp clinical instincts as a doctor has no real value if I do it in a way that is entirely about me and not we. Love must be the fundamental motivation for what we do. This ethos of right motive is fundamental if we're going to move forward. This ethic of right action shaped by right motive must prevail if the nation's quest for forward movement is going to be achieved. I suggest that the underperformance of our nation economically cannot be separated from the social and spiritual deficiencies of our people. I suggest that the crime, the insufficient productivity, the poor educational outcomes are all related to one degree or the other to the diminished willingness of too many 
to do what is right. Too many see doing right as insignificant and trite. Too many devalue right and elevate might. Too many are wrong and strong. We must be willing in this season Ladies and gentlemen, to take right action to achieve right results. It was Martin Luther King Jr. who said, and I'm quoting, The time is always right to do what is right, and I declare the time is right now. Doing right must be embraced by the members of the cabinet as much as it should be embraced by skilled carpenters who make cabinets. Doing right must be embraced by the executive in the corner office in as much as it must be embraced by the youth on the corner. Doing right must be embraced by the Queen's Council and by the Guidance Councillor, by the police and by the plumber. All of us must be willing to do what is right. Now, let's be clear. I am not talking about being perfect. I, we know we are human beings. But for God's sake, we don't have to appear to be pursuing perfection in the wrong direction. We don't have to try to seek to be perfectly evil. We need to re-embrace right in this season. I submit for our consideration that brothers and sisters, as we pursue the necessary promotion and defense of human rights there must be a concomitant commitment to what is humanly right because if you think about it human rights void of what is humanly right will ultimately lead to a proliferation of human wrongs with dire consequences for the future and fabric of this nation. We must commit to right actions based on right motive. You can beat the bench and say, here, here. But not only should we promote right action based on right motive, but I want to suggest that we must elevate right attitude based on right mindset. Pressing forward requires not only that we take action, right action, but that we have right attitude. We know the saying, altitude, the alti altitude is determined by attitude. I suggest that the nation's altitude has been stunted by the wrong attitude of too many of its leaders and citizens generally. If we're going to move forward in faith, hope, and love, we must get our attitude right. It is important to note that right attitude is inextricably linked to right mindset. And therefore, the apostle in verse 4 to 7 gives an impressive description of love. He says, and follow me, he says, love is patient. He, he says, love is kind. Love is not envious. Love is not boastful. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. It does not keep a record of wrongs. He says about love, it does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hope, it always persevere. I want to suggest that these character traits would serve Jamaica well. No, man, we, we need some more Jamaicans who are patient and kind. If that happens, I suggest public order would increase and road accidents would decrease. We need more leaders who are like love as it were, looking out for others and not self-seeking. If that happens, we would have less impropriety and less scandals. There would be less murders and reduced reprisals. 
If more Jamaicans expressed love and did not keep a record of wrongs, we would have a more progressive society if we integrated love in our lifestyle. Can you imagine, if my math is correct, that the population of Jamaica since 1962 has increased about 1.7 times. But over the same period, the number of homicides have increased 23 times. We need improved attitude through renewed mindset. Too many of us in our, in our daily lives seek to normalize the abnormal, celebrate the abhorrent, we, we try to make desirable the despicable and we rhapsodize the reprehensible. And that needs to stop. We need to reassess where we're going. And we need to embrace what I call the righteous effect. I submit that righteousness does in fact exalt a nation. And sin remains as a, a, a reproach to any people. Right and wrong is not an, a, a relic of the past. This is not cassette and diskette. Right and wrong is still relevant now. And it's relevant for all people. I suggest that if we embrace what is right, our economy will do better. Our social lives will improve. And it will benefit the people totally. As a nation, we have suffered by a crippling cynicism and a stifling skepticism that is getting worse. We, we like to say no better no day. And we go further and we say no better no day at John shop. Totally ignoring that along the street of life there are many enterprises apart from the one operated by John. Yeah, man, we must resolve that we want better and we must pursue better. We must resolve that we're not settling only for what is in John's shop. We're going to pursue the better that is available. We must resolve mentally that we do not have to be purposely cross and perpetually cross. We do not need to be mean and wicked. As Jamaicans, we do not have to be unproductive and unprofessional. We reject those banners. We do not have to be impolite and uncouth. We do not have to be corrupt. We are not by nature scammers. We reject that view. We push back on the philosophy of evil promoted in our sayings, our songs, and our slangs. And we embrace the practice of what is good by embracing a mindset in this season of growth and continuous improvement. We will go up and not down. We will get better and not worse. We will move forward and not backward. But we need right attitude shaped by right mindset. Are you still here? I recommend... A sustained and coordinated national development effort inspired by a passion for right action and an embracing of right attitude. This would support Vision 2030 with its lofty and commendable goals. I call it loving interventions for transformation lift. This would see national development partners coming together and agreeing on some specific actions to take if we're going to achieve our vision or get closer to Vision 2030. We call for a lift from Anchovy to Alman Town. We call for a lift from Norwood to Norbrook. We call for a lift from Irish Town to Islington. We call for a lift from downtown Mobay to downtown Kingston. We call for a lift from Petersfield to Palmer's Cross. We call for a lift in the nation. We need our young people to be lifted. We need our men to be lifted. We need our leadership to be lifted. We need our educational output to be lifted. In this season, we need lifting. 
some of the guiding principles for Vision 2030, only eight years away, must be supported by a strong action plan built on right actions and right attitude. This would help us with the social cohesion we're talking about and with the transformational culture that we seek. It is full-time, brothers and sisters. In the interesting verse, in verse 11 of the chapter read earlier, Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I, I reasoned as a child. But when I became an adult, I put away that which is childish. We are on the verge ministers, leaders of celebrating our 60th anniversary as an independent nation. And while, I, I, you know, we're still a relatively young nation, we are no longer a nation child. We must grow beyond our juvenile tendencies to emphasize self over community, me over we, party over country, self and sectoral interests over national well-being. We must rise above our puerile behaviors and infantile thinking. We must show our maturity as a nation in the way we think and behave. We must rise up in this 60th year to be and become the great nation we are destined to be. We must summon the will to renew and to rise. This must be our when. Our when must come. Our when is now. Let us arise and make it happen. Brothers and sisters, if we're going to move forward with faith, hope, and love, it requires an increased commitment to take action. It requires building a culture characterized by right attitude. Taking right action is about doing. And embracing right attitude is about being. When we combine right doing and right being... Then and only then we'll be able to maximize our potential. Then and only then we'll be able to move forward in the power of our Lord Jesus with the virtues that are universal and enduring. The three that will remain, faith, hope, and love. We can move forward. Yes, we can. But right action and right attitude are critical. We must resolve that we will do our best and be our best. And only with that resolve will we be able to rise up and to pursue the goal of making Jamaica under God, a nation that increases in beauty, fellowship, and prosperity, and allow Jamaica to play her part in advancing the welfare of the whole human base. Let us arise and move forward with faith, hope, and love. God bless you. God bless you.